defines the place of energy in the realization of our national aspirations. These reforms are therefore aimed at ensuring that we respond to this constitutional mandate to provide clean, affordable, reliable, and accessible energy. The attempt at reform in this sector is not new, as I'm sure all of you know. In fact, the last task force was the fourth, I am told, a fact that has been repeatedly cited to me by some naysayers. However, there is a significant difference that I want to point out between this and other task force reports. And that difference is the resolve to implement the recommendations driven by the reality of where we are today. Ladies and gentlemen, the energy sector is at a tipping point. And the only choice we have is to turn it around. And that is why I have said, and wish to repeat this again, these reforms are irreversible. This explains why the report and projection out of it is structured as an urgent government agenda with a steering implementation committee and a, sub, a cabinet subcommittee that are working closely with the ministry in following that process through. The reforms are sector-wide and far-reaching. They are being implemented in the short to the medium term. And as you know, there has been a lot of focus and great interest in the immediate outcomes, and in particular, in the reduction of tariff issue in light of the president's commitment during the last Mashujah day on 20th of October and this, but this constitutes only one component of the reform agenda. Let me therefore begin to deal with some of the reform agendas and because of the interest in tariffs, let me begin on this question of reduction of electricity costs. As you're all aware, on the 7th of January, we gazetted the first 15% tranche of power tariff reductions. The tariff reduction, of course, was in fulfillment of the commitment by His Excellency the President to the nation. This reduction, and because I've had a lot of this, you know, so where did it come from? Ho oh, oh, ho, you know, and uh, up to the sixth, many people did not believe it was going to happen. I don't know why. This has been achieved through a sector wide initiative that is focused on improving efficiencies within. The energy ecosystem. Can I have something for my notes? In particular, that is focusing on loss reduction. So far, many Kenyans today can attest. Can somebody give me something to write? Many Kenyans can attest to a significant drop in their electricity bills today. Key emphasis here is that while we were targeting a 15% reduction in tariff, in fact, our lower tire customers are enjoying a reduction of up to 23%. Last week, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers gave an indication that this reduction would translate into a 10% reduction in manufacturing costs. These actions are critical at this point when the nation is recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. It will get money into people's pockets and it will reduce production, especially at the small and medium enterprise levels. We are following through on a number of measures and actions that will continue to improve efficiency across the sector. We are also focused on reforms around the institutions in order to strengthen alignment, transparency, and accountability. The Kenya Power and Lighting Company is a critical utility and a key entry point for these reforms. And we have some good indications. The improvement in the firm's financial performance in the year ending June 2021, 
Can I have something from my neck? It can come from the cup. Just a moment, please. <laughs> now I'm not sure where I was. Okay. The KPLC is a critical entry point to these reforms because it is the final deliverer of the service of power to our people. And the reforms are already beginning within the KPLC to bear fruit. But we appreciate that a lot of work remains to be done to restore the KPLC into an operationally efficient and financially stable utility. But work is also going on in this regard across the entire utility and its service chain. We are looking at business processes and more importantly, growing the sense of accountability for responsibilities of every staff and or supervisor. But this exercise is not limited to the KPLC. We are also looking at the other sagas in the ministry to ensure alignment across the ecosystem. For instance, you will have noticed, if you have been looking at this sector closely, that we are moving towards mandating agencies in a manner that aligns their work to the value chain. For example, prospecting so that we can have the GDC focusing on prospecting, generation, we are focusing on some that are looking at the renewables. We are focusing on transmission, which explains part of the reason of designating a tracker at the system as a systems operator, so that we can have the management of the entire transmission lines from the point of picking to the point of distribution, and so forth. So the idea is really to align the agencies to the various points of the value chain in the energy sector. We are also play, uh, paying very close attention to our competitive edge in terms of renewable energy. And the focus here is on the development of renewables and their use, particularly in far-flanked areas that are not connected to the national grid. But closely linked to the functional element, is the imperative of raising the level of governance across the sector, both at the operational but also at the strategic levels. This is a matter that the Ministry is playing, paying very close attention to because I believe that if we address the governance issues, we are going to deal with a range of challenges that are at play we are going to improve the entire systems in terms of their delivery and that is going to translate into better service delivery for the, for the country. The turnaround of a sector as important and as complex as energy requires an all hands on deck approach. We must, all of us, pull in the same direction for us to gather momentum and sustain the change that is required. For those of us in authority, it goes without saying that this comes with substantial responsibility. We must develop a culture of accountability as part of the management practice in this sector. And we will ensure, certainly I will, that those who do not discharge their duties diligently and responsibly will be held to account. There has been a sense of impunity to a certain degree where there is no supervision, there is no follow through, and this is part of the reason why we are seeing a degree of laxity that must be tamed, and it will be tamed. Let me now, ladies and gentlemen, turn to the question of engaging with the IPPs, which is one of great interest. 
As you know, this was a key focus of the presidential task force. And the recommendation in this regard are clear. The recommendation of the task force is that there is an imperative to engage with the IPPs in order to relook at some of the arrangements and contracts with a view to reviewing the costs as a means of reducing the cost of power in this country. The ministry has led the process of elaborating that framework of engagement, and I am pleased to inform as follows. One, we made a call for engagement for an initial exchange of views with the objective of identifying possible areas of consultation and engagement. I am pleased to report that the IPP is not only heeded this call, but have actually engaged with us in listening sessions that were chaired by CAS and outlined a number of areas of interest. The engagements have been constructive and many have offered pointers that are invaluable towards our objective of making our power competitive, suitable, uh, uh, stable, and accessible. I look forward to the next stage of this process. And I wish to take this opportunity to urge, as I have done before, good faith that will enable us to engage in a process that will be mutually beneficial to both parties. We, as government, have a first order responsibility to our citizens that is prescribed by the Constitution. In this case, we are expected and called to provide affordable, reliable, least cost power that will enable our nation to be regionally and globally competitive. Having looked at some of the contractual documents of the various engagements, I strongly believe that there is room for improvement that will enable us to benefit and believe that analysis already done, at the end of this process, we will have a robust framework that ensures risks are more evenly distributed, resulting in a better, balanced, and more sustainable commercial arrangement. We are in the final preparatory stages for the official engagements with each of the IPPs. So far, as is demonstrable, the government has extended herself, including in taking critical actions towards the objective of reduction in tariffs. It is my hope that this goodwill by government will be reciprocated by the IPPs when we commence the formal negotiations. I also strongly believe that this process can be undertaken in an amicable manner that is mutually beneficial. Considering that the government has a primary responsibility of providing for its citizens, and that the investors, IPP, have a corresponding and shared objective to support Kenya's aspiration for development, it is possible to strike a win-win end situation. At the end of this process, we hope for reduction of tariffs relating to generation as well as a new clear framework for investment in the energy sector that is consistent, that is transparent, that is predictable, and that delivers a stable, robust, resilient energy network from end to end. Ladies and gentlemen, while the reform agenda is a large and complex task, it is taking place in a rapidly evolving context. The global push for decarbonization has placed renewable energy at the core of this agenda. And Kenya, as you all know, is at the forefront of that with over 92% of our electricity currently generated from renewable, clean energy sources. This commitment and continued investment in green energy places our country in good stand to gain from global commitments to green manufacturing and demand for clean energy, creating jobs, upgrading the livelihoods of our people, and helping Kenya in fulfilling her commitment to limit and mitigate climate change. 
in a sector where investment horizon is necessarily long term, it is important that transparency becomes the norm. And indeed, it is embedded in the way we do business in order that we can, uh, we can st uh, strengthen trust from our investors. The ministry has commenced the development of a policy roadmap that will culminate in the energy white paper, drawing from our experience and journey thus far, but also locating these within the local, regional, and global trends in energy dynamics. And hopefully, this white paper can help us to map the energy trajectory and journey for our motherland. These reforms and Kenya's energy journey will require continued support and engagement of the public. We understand that Kenyans have been adversely affected by poor service delivery, high costs, and previous unfulfilled promises in the energy sector. And that there may be some, in fact, who are skeptical about this latest round of reforms. I want to assure all Kenyans that we are determined to see these reforms through and are focused to make affordable energy a reality for all Kenyans. Our commitment to this will be shown through our actions, the first of which has already been delivered last week with the 15% tariff reduction. And you will continue to see through further reductions and service improvements as well in a sector that is decisively moving into the future as one for the benefit of all Kenyans. The reform journey, ladies and gentlemen, has never been easy anywhere. Our resolve is to take this to its logical conclusion, and that is my mandate. But these reforms will be assisted greatly by the continued support of all. In this regard, I wish to thank everyone for your messages of encouragement and advice. I've received a lot of advice, some very good, and some, some good too, okay? <laughs> a lot of advice for which I want to thank everyone that has sent these advices to us. I also want to call on each one of us as citizens, as institutions, as ministries, departments, and agencies of government as well as, as partners of Kenya to rally behind the reforms in the energy sector. This for us, we believe, will be a model, not just for our country, but for the region and for the world. I thank you for your kind attention. I think I can take a few, a few questions or points of clarification. Do you have any question? And people yes, keep quiet, uh, it's one of two things. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. Um, my name is Hassan Mugambi from uh, Citizen TV. Um, in the spirit of uh, inculcating the culture of accountability in the sector, um, we saw head roll last week uh, at Kenya Power. Are we going to see the same in other parts tables such as Ketrako? Someone else? Uh, good morning, my name is Alan Alpo from KBC TV. Uh, you spoke about uh, the mandate of these various institutions in the energy sector. And I'm just curious then, what is the update of some of the, you know, the new revenue streams that are projected to come from, for example, uh, the EP sector? Uh, is that still ongoing or what's the update on that one? Thank you. Hello, my name is Otiago from Business Lady. My question is about sustainability of new times. Uh, given that Kenya Power takes 30% of the revenue that passes off the 70 to power producers, and Kenya Power actually say that they need to be distributed, uh, the burden needs to be distributed across the sector. Are there any specifics uh, as to how much Kenya is willing to take, uh, how much? Uh, 
the other and the, and the answers we see about IPPs if they if they don't agree to the government is their fault or not? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Gordon Ogutu. I write for Engineering in Kenya magazine. Uh, yesterday, the Institution of Engineers of Kenya put out a statement in regards to the arrest of engineers at uh, KPLC. Uh, in their opinion, they think that um, the, 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 the security agencies should go harder at the vandals that uh, uh, interfere with the infrastructure projects. Uh, do you have any comment in this regard? Thank you. Can I just take those first? Eh? So thank you very much for those um, very crucial questions, and we've had them. Um, let me just uh, underscore the point around accountability. We are going to drive accountability across uh, the sector because it does not matter whether you're talking about generation or transmission or distribution. Even if you are very good generators, unless you have efficient transmission, unless you have a responsive distribution, then it does not matter that one of those sectors is functioning optimally. And in order to make it a whole system, that's why I was using the concept of an ecosystem. It must be an end to end, and that accountability is going to be demanded of every point in that value chain. And, and I think that should answer. So it's not about KPLC or Ketrack or whatever. We are going to look at every weak point and work towards strengthening that point. Um, a number of uh, investigations are ongoing, as I, you probably know, and uh, we cannot preclude uh, the findings of those investigations. What I can tell you is that we will follow the findings of those investigations to the end, whatever those findings are. So let's just be uh, uh, patient and you will see this thing as it rolls out. Um, now, I am going to let uh, KPLC speak to the electric vehicles, uh, Rosemary, at some point, so that you can answer, because that was a specific, um, a specific question to you. But um, the, again, to the point about an ecosystem, and I began by saying the 15% tariff reduction has been achieved by, to a large measure by looking at the entire system. So this burden is not going to be carried by one agency per se. So we are looking at the entire system, and it's not whether it's KPLC or KenGen or whatever. Actually, every agency has had to step up, which is why everybody is standing behind here. So it's not one or the other. We are working to make sure that this, this system functions in a manner that optimizes the production and the distribution and servicing of our electricity to our people. So, uh, what happens? Again, another speculation. We've had this speculation. You have been told, you know, you cannot even call IPPs. You know, you can't call them, you know. I don't know what was signed. Uh, I am sure all of you have signed contracts, including your employment contracts. Uh, somewhere in that contract, there is a clause which would say, uh, you, we can talk about this contract again. True or not true? A contract is a contract. It's a base document of an agreement between two parties. Circumstances can change. Uh, uh, situations can change. Preferences can change. You know, there are all manner of circumstances. So we are not coming to this lightly. I think that's very important to know. We are not coming to this lightly. And the engagement, in fact, with the IPPs, which I can ask Cass to also respond to because he chaired the listening committee, has been very amenable. And that is why I was saying some of the discussions in the media about without facts and figures, you know, people are just speculating. Also, you know, government wants to nationalize, I don't know what is going on, and so forth and so forth. This government is, is operates within the kill of the rule of law but we understand there is no immutable contract, okay? And if circumstances have changed as indeed they have, there is a framework for engagement. So that is how we are proceeding with this. Very meticulous, very structured, and consciously guided by the principles of international relations in relation to contract and everything else. So I, nobody should worry. 
about, and there are a range, a range of tools, frankly, that can be deployed and that have been deployed. By the way, the place we find ourselves as a country is neither unique, it is not specific to us, nor is it unimaginable. Nothing wrong with it. There are many countries that have, have come to the point of engaging with their partners in various points, whether it is in energy or other places. So this notion about us being in a place that nobody has trended is also misinformation, frankly. Yeah? Um, on the engineering uh, association, I think the engineering association, and it would be helpful for you to advise, uh, for them to really uh, be uh, uh, abiding by the rule of law, uh, anybody can be asked, is going to be held to account, even engineers. Nobody is above the law, and I'm sure you can attest to that. So I think the issue is to ask for due process, to establish what the situation is. I will tell you something. The pylons in Naivasha, if they had come down, it would have taken us a minimum of four weeks to get this country alight. That is the scale of risk we are talking. So I, I think people, let people not be flippant about this. It is serious and it is going to be taken with the seriousness it deserves. Rosemary, on the, on the electric vehicle. Thank you, CS. Uh, good morning, everyone. On electric vehicles, electrical, electric vehicles consume energy, consume electricity, and Kenya Power in her mandate is a distributor of electricity. So we will continue with the innovation to move into the EV space. We are already uh, having bikes, which we are having on a pilot to just understand the dynamics around electric vehicles, the dynamics around um, charging, the dynamics around the funding of the charging, we have a billing system that runs prepaid and postpaid billing, so we are looking at uh, the dynamics around postpaid and prepaid uh, um, uh, engagements with customers in the EV area. Electric vehicles are now uh, becoming more and more affordable, so Kenya Power will continue with this innovation in her mandate as, the dist as a distributor, as an off-taker in the country, and that will not be interfered with in the reforms. Indeed, the reforms we see helping us to fast track the innovation of getting involved in the electric vehicle uh, space. It is not just vehicles, it is a whole ecosystem that involves the charging, involves the charging of the energy that the electric vehicles use, involves the models of charging and engagement with the EV users. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. This corner seems to be very active. <laughs> Can we go to this corner? And I've not had a lady speak. Okay. Um, my name is Nina Saban I'm from MTV. Uh, my question to you, Madam Chair, is uh, when are we set to see uh, the net water, the 15% reduction? Awesome. Someone else? Okay, uh, my name is Dan, Dan Kabul from K24. I'm a bit concerned about the issue of uh, green energy when we talk about solar uh, power because most homes are not able to maybe like install solar power because of the high cost of mm. these panels and uh, accessories. Mm. So what is maybe, maybe what is the ministry doing about this to make sure that people can have for the new green energy without yeah. at least a, with minimum or with less a cost in the spirit of promoting green energy can respond to Good morning, Stephanie Rory, Citizen Digital. Two questions. One is on uh, the 15% tariff reduction that we saw. Uh, we knew that would come from the reduction of information from losses. Why do those losses not come from the power uh, without a sense of that reduction? The second question is on IPPs. You mentioned about the start of formal negotiation. We know the target was for the end of Q1 to stay two months away. What are the timelines to get in there? And, is the key one that's speaking. Thank you. Mm. Good morning, I'm from the Business Daily. My question is that the last month connectivity problem. In the current year, Treasury reduced uh, the amount that allocated for the subsidy 
from around 700 million to 100 million. Now, I want you to know it's rather than to reflect on uh, that people will be, uh, will be compelled to, to pay you more for that, or it will lead to a reduction in the number of households that will be connected. Okay, thank you. Let's take those for a, a moment as well, and I will uh, allow Ipra to speak to the question of uh, solar connectivity. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, because it is uh, tariffs eh, and cost of uh, solar solar connection. Uh, then I will also allow who will speak to the last mile. Yeah. Rosemary will speak to the uh, last mile together with uh, there was something else for KPLC, the, the 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 reduction. Let me speak to the reduction. The reduction has been explained, and I don't know why people don't believe it. <laughs> Just like the last time, the reduction is going to happen in two trenches. The first trench has been effected. The second trench is supposed to be effected within this first quarter. So we have begun to work on that. Our work is going on on that, and we'll be briefing where we are as we progress. As I've indicated to you, depending on the band you're talking, the people have already received more than 15%, depending on who you are. So these things are going to progress, and as we continue, uh, in, whether it is in terms of negotiations, whether it is in terms of uh, curtailing losses, whether it is in terms of growing efficiency, you begin, you have already begun to see the effect of that. Um, so that, that is the timeline we have given ourselves and we will work towards achieving it, yes? Um, the, I will let uh, Ipra speak to the solar, you know, uh, although of course this has to also be contextualized in terms of the cost of technology and, and so forth. But I'll let uh, Ipra speak to that and then KPLC will speak to the last mile connectivity. Ipra, yeah. keep talking. Thank you, Madam CS. Um, good morning, everyone. I think on the matter of uh, solar PV, uh, we do license uh, uh, the technicians who actually install solar PV and also we do license the importation. I think there are two questions here. I think the first one has been issue of quality and access. Uh, we've seen in the past uh, substandard panels being introduced into the country, and we've been working together with uh, another agency, which is KEPS, to ensure that we do get the right quality of panels into the country. Uh, over time, we've seen the cost of PV come down. But I think within the context of particularly the last two years, particularly with COVID, uh, there has been a global challenge with an increase of solar PV cost by about 10%, and this has been a logistical issue attributable to COVID across the entire country. But I think, uh, secondly, I think there is a, an issue which uh, Madam Sears and the Ministry have picked up, and I know these are concerns for Kenyans and the media has addressed themselves to this issue, which is there has been the introduction of VAT on, uh, on solar PV. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ministry has, I think, at a policy position has uh, made this known within government, and I think the matter is pending before Parliament to see how uh, uh, this can be looked at at the, at the greater ma macro space so that we see how uh, this VAT issue can be addressed to ensure that there's access. So I think there are two questions here. I think there's the quality and the cost. Uh, but, but we want to give a commitment as a regulator. We'll continue to ensure as part of the agenda of having 100% electrification in the country to ensure that we ha do have access and have a complementary effort in electrification through on-grid and off-grid -off electrification. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, CS. Uh, DFI uh, donor funded uh, project. We have GOK funded projects. The figure you mentioned is not correct. This year, the government has set aside 1 billion shillings towards the last mile connectivity program. Um, uh, what mean? Will it mean le less people connected? Will it mean people paying more? Neither of the two. Last mile evolves over time. If the initial investment has placed the high value items, that is the transformer and the high voltage line, then the subsequent investment is lower to connect the last customer. So we are concentrating on connecting those that already are around transformers and we should be able to connect a good population of, of the country with the resources available. In addition, we have uh, programs that are reaching out to the unreached areas. 
There is the, 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 the off-grid solar access program, which is reaching out to citizens who are not within the reach of the grid. And therefore, the investment is not just on the last mile government program. It is also supported by other programs, and we expect to connect an equivalent number to those connected last year in this financial year. It is also not a time-bound program. It is an ongoing program, and we expect that as we go along, more and more Kenyans will be connected towards 100% access by the year 2030. Thank you. Okay, the last round. Yes? Did you not ask? <laughs> I think somebody else should speak, unless they, they, they defer to you. My name is Brian from Nation, and uh, my question goes to KPLC. We are made to understand that uh, there were reports given to the management about uh, the bad situation of the towers before they are collapsed, and that uh, you failed to ask. Is there any truth in this statement? And then the second one is about uh, have you done any preliminary valuation of your transmission assets, etc.? said to be transferred to get stuck, what is their value? And uh, how is this likely to affect your share price? It has not been exactly performing very well, and the effects to investors think. Mm. <coughs> uh, good morning, my name is James Bomeni. I run uh, Energy Magazine, the most important support. My question is on, uh, we have the technology to secure the transmission line. How come we have not adopted that technology? Secondly, uh, debt management at uh, KPLC during the, as a shareholder, uh, how aggressive are we going to go to collect this debt? And do we, do we see also prosecution of people who owe debts to KPLC? My last question is on uh, buying of transformers and meters uh, privately. They may be allowed private organizations to buy the transformers and meters and they be certified by necessary authority so to re reduce the delay in, uh, in metering and transformer. Mm. And I believe that uh, uh, we have concentrated so much on generation. We have a committee that can look at the demand for power because I think that is where the challenge is. How do we grow the demand for power? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Miano, do you want to speak to that? To the demand, the generation? Okay, let me, let me uh, I'm going to allow um, Ketrako to speak to the, sec the securing of the transmission infrastructure. Um, then I will allow um, perhaps Rosemary again to speak to the issue around the share price. But I don't think I want to answer for you a question around reports, you know, whether you received the reports and so forth and so forth. Um, I, I think uh, this is not a question that can be comprehensively responded to here because it's a matter that is under investigation. And the prudent thing to do is for you to have patience. The most important thing for me to say here is really to thank the officers from KPLC and Ketraco that were led by the peers and that worked around the clock to make sure that we did not have what could have ended up being a tragic outage of power across this nation. So first of all, it is very important to appreciate the amount of work, the amount of dedication that each of those officers deployed and uh, around the clock, basically. As everybody was uh, talking, we were looking at, 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 uh, at, at what was going on. Um, a lot of work since then has gone on in terms of establishing uh, uh, the state of the entire transmission network across the country, and I'll let Ketrako speak to that. As I began this briefing, my first statement was to reassure the nation that we were confident that our transmission 
infrastructure was safe and sound. But I'll let Ketrako speak to that. The second one is the issue around demand, which I will allow uh, Rebecca to speak to if, if she, she pleases. But just to indicate that given the rate of growth of this nation, and perhaps Kipto too, given the rate, the projected growth rate of this nation, the demand for energy is going to grow upwards. And it's going to grow in quantum leaps. leaps. Why, why do I say so? If you look at just the transport sector that Rosemary was talking to, was it yesterday I saw the first electric bus has arrived, you know? And so if we are going to translate into a, a, a electric mobility, then it means the demand for power is going to go high. So there is no doubt, as we are opening the northern corridor, the northern corridor, the lapset all the way up, it is power. As we, as we expand our port, as we grow our blue economy, so the demand for power, in my mind, is going to be growing. It, it is not a problem. And we are also seeing it at the household level, at the small and medium enterprise level. Um, uh, as we sit here, we are having quite a number of people that are awaiting connection. Isn't that so, Rosemary? So I think the demand is not a problem. Uh, but what we need to do is to align that system so that that demand to the point of generation is optimized. You know, it's optimized. And so we do not have costs that are being passed on to consumers which are kicking the price of power up rather than lower in order to incentivize. Because the intention is to, in the intention is to incentivize productivity, you know, and not to prohibit it by the cost of, of power. We must be uh, competitive regionally because we are an economic hub. But, and, and that means we cannot have power that is making our production more expensive than our neighboring countries. It will, lose, it will make us lose the edge uh, in terms of our economic leadership. So that I don't have a problem with demand, uh, but, uh, and I think this is why the planning and even the white paper we are talking about and the plans in terms of aligning, alignment across the ecosystem become very, very important. So let me let uh, Ket Ketrako, eh? Yeah, Ketrako say something. Or is it you, Piers? Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Piers. Uh, let me speak on two things. And the first thing is uh, the taking over of the transmission line of KPLC to Ketrako. The task force uh, came in very clearly and realized that we have duplicity of work. We have KPLC lines which are almost 7,000, 4,000 kilometers, and we have the Ketrako lines which are 2,000. The thought, of course, is coming to 7,000. How then do you ensure that uh, you have one entity operating these things? And what, therefore, we have been able to do is that uh, the assessment of these lines is being done, and we are hoping that by the middle of next month we'll have a complete report before you actually have these lines going to Ketrako, definitely be the aspect of the O&M. And this is being taken care of, and we hope that uh, by the end of uh, next month, this will have actually been done. The second thing I want to speak to is the issue of the protection of the transmission lines. You have been told now that we have a total of 7,000 kilometers of transmission line. What we are actually doing is, yes, there are certain measures which have been put in place. But first of all, the citizens have a role. And as you are aware, one thing that we are going to do is that we are going to have restricted areas of some of the areas, power stations, uh, some of the power lines. Those are actually going to now to be considered as restricted areas. So that then forms part of the deterrence. The second thing we are actually going to do is that, yes, we are going to engage uh, uh, other uh, security agencies who are going to help. That is, of course, uh, the police service. Uh, we are also going to have certain equipment that are going to assist in doing the surveillance. Uh, both KPLC and Ketrako, they have uh, a helicopter, which, of course, go from, 
from time to time. But then the aspect of Nyumbakumi is also helping us in doing that. So the security of this transmission line is actually going to be a responsibility of all the citizens, the security organs, the citizens themselves, and then the other instructions that the cabinet secretary has actually told the sagas that are, are involved is to ensure that regular and inspection of these lines has to be done so that earlier detections are done so that we don't end up with some of the situations we have actually experienced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I noticed that I didn't respond to the other question with the uh, indulgence CS on uh, the cost to the end user of the last mile connectivity. Mm. The cost to the Kenyan citizen remains 15,000, uh, even with the reduced uh, budgetary uh, allocation towards the last mile in the grid areas and even in the off-grid areas. So the cost to the consumer will remain 15,000. The government has gracefully allowed the consumer to pay it gradually as they consume. So you are connected at the point of connection, and then as you vend and consume electricity, a small portion of that amount that you pay goes towards paying the 15,000 until along the way the Kenya city, Kenyan citizen uh, manages to pay the 15,000. So the cost to the end user will not change even as the allocations change from one area to another. On the area of the share price of Kenya Power, uh, I will not add more to what uh, Madam C has already indicated, that the reforms are being undertaken under the ambit of the Ministry of Energy and coordinated within the confines of the law. It is known to us that Kenya Power is a listed company in the Nairobi Stock Exchange and due process must be followed in some of these aspects and it is our intention that that due process will be followed in any area of implementation. So we will, so we will operate within the law and we will follow due process. That is why the process has begun by assessing and then additional actions will be taken based on the findings. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think on the matter of demand, um, from a standpoint of the regulator, we do monitor uh, demand and supply in the country, matching generation and what KPLC distributes on a daily basis, and we do advise the ministry. I think a good standpoint in terms of concerns of demand that James has, has, has raised, uh, we did see demand uh, hit a new peak of 2037 megawatts. This was in November last year. Mm. This was still at a time when uh, the country has just, just been opened up by the president from COVID. We are still not out of the ravages of COVID. And that's a very good indicator in terms of where we are going as, uh, in terms of demand. Mm. I think really on the second point is uh, the interventions being led by the CS in terms of reforms and particularly strengthening the network, both the distribution of the transmission network. This will help us uh, in uh, meeting the unserved energy in the country. We do have people who are ready and willing to be connected, but they have not been connected because the grid isn't there yet or the grid isn't as reliable where they are connected. Mm -hmm. And I think with those interventions uh, through the reforms, this will also serve to increase demand. I think the third issue around demand, I, we do have a, a multi uh, sector-wide uh, committee that has been looking at this demand and the ministry as well working with the Ministry of Industrialization and CAM and KEPSA where you sit. There are quarterly engagements. We also engage with them as a regulator in terms of demand creation and this really is linked to the question of a cost where we talk to the tariff reduction, the 15% that has already been achieved and the next tranche of 15%. As you've heard, uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers really says that this will lead to a 10% reduction in the cost of manufacturing. Mm. This really means that uh, industries then are now incentivized from a governmental standpoint to introduce new production lines, be able to employ more Kenyans, and be able then to uptake their uh, requirements in terms of the energy that they do consume. So with, this is really linked to the, the tariff conversation, the tariff question. Mm. With a reduction in the tariff, then we see an increase in manufacturing. Mm. We then see more Kenyans being employed. And eventually then we bring more people to be connected and then eventually reduce the cost of power across the customer base that KPLC has. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rebecca. Thank you very much, Madam CS, and good morning, everyone. In terms of power generation, just to confirm that generation is planned in the master plan for power in the document called least, power, least cost power development plan. And as has been said by the CS and also the regulator,
this is deep planning, it is organized planning that focuses, it focuses and has a focus on what the country will need and that then informs the generation plans. I am happy to note that as a country we have enough generation including the best international practice of having a small reserve. If you look back into the year 20708, as a country, we had a higher demand than generation, and that's why we were having power cuts, we were having rationing, and you would buy a newspaper to check which day your area is having electricity. Madam CS, that is history as of now, because we have enough generation. What needs to happen, like you said, is to ensure that the whole ecosystem is planning together and avoid a, a burning platform where the demand is left behind the generation and the two must be synchronized. Thank you, Madam. So let me um, bring this media briefing to a close by one underscoring um, the imperative of the reform journey that we have set ourselves on. Um, this is good for this nation. It is first of all good for the sector because it's always important to have an efficient, uh, productive sector, but it is very, very important for the country at both the social services level, individual electricity consumer level, but also the economy and where we want to go as a country within the region and globally. It is also important because there is a huge expectation of our leadership, particularly in the renewables. And so we are trending a path ahead of others and we believe we have a duty of care to the international community by setting up the model that can be followed for, by others. I want to thank the for the state for staying with us uh, in this journey. Uh, there has been a lot of interest. I think there will continue being an interest. And we wanted to have this media briefing, which we shall continue to have uh, regularly in order to update Kenyans on this matter of great public concern. So I thank you very much for your time and for coming to Kawi, and we look forward for our ne to our next engagement. I thank you and good day. Thank you, Madam CS. I think uh, 